Welcome back to Truth By Light, a ministry of Parker Memorial Baptist Church. I'm so glad you've joined us. If you'd like to follow along with us, I just want to remind you that these Bible study books are available to you. All you have to do is call our church office at 256-236-5628. Now, maybe you follow along on YouTube and you want to know every time we upload a new lesson. And we would love for you to subscribe to this YouTube channel. And all you have to do is click the little bell at the bottom and you'll get notifications every time we upload a new lesson. You can also follow us at Truth By Light on Facebook and we'd love to see you there as well. So we are in Genesis chapter 37. If you have your copy of God's Word, and I hope that you do, we would love for you to join us there. Genesis chapter 37, we have been following the narrative of Jacob's life. Now in this chapter, we're kind of going to take a turn and we're going to focus more on Joseph. Joseph is the second to youngest son of Jacob. He is the oldest son of Jacob and Rachel. Benjamin was born after Joseph, but if you remember from reading, um, Rachel actually died in childbirth when she was giving birth to Benjamin. So he has 12 sons and we are about to see some things unfold that um, sort of reflect on maybe his favoritism that he experienced growing up it did not die. And as a matter of fact, he has cultivated it. It's, it's been fostered in his relationships with his sons, and we're going to see how that has um, turned out for him and for his children. But first, let's look at some questions this week. What do we do when other people are not receptive to what we know God has said? Have you ever thought about that? What what do we do? Um, I know that, that as I have matured in my faith, and I bet you've experienced this as well, I become more bold. I want to tell people what God has, has told me through His Word. And the more bold you become in doing that, um, occasionally you can feel a little isolated, can't you? I know I've lost Facebook friends. Um, there are times that I feel sure I've not been invited to certain things because people think I'm different, and, and I am, and that's okay. But is there anything that we can do to help ourselves connect with other people when it comes to sharing God's Word, to sharing what, what we know God has told us? How do we make sure that God gets the glory, and it's not something that we're doing for selfish gain or for people to pay attention to us? These are all really valid questions, and they're questions that we're going to dig into today. So let's get started. Joseph tended sheep. So he would go out with his brothers, and they would work the field just like a shepherd would. But if his brothers made a mistake, if they did something they weren't supposed to do, Joseph was known to be a bit of a tattletale. Well, as you can imagine, that did not win him a lot of friends among his 11 brothers. So we see that in verse 3 of chapter 37, Jacob, the word just says it very plainly, Jacob loved Joseph more than his other sons. Now, again, this was the child that was born to Rachel, and Jacob is no stranger to favoritism. We know that Jacob was born a twin and his brother was Esau. And we know that Jacob's mother, he was her favorite, and Jacob's father, the favorite was Esau. So right from the moment he was born, Jacob was immediately introduced to playing favorites. Then, as he moved and he um, lived with his uncle Laban, we find out that he was, uh, Leah was given in marriage to him, and then it was Rachel. He loved Rachel more than Leah, and obviously played favorites between his two wives. Now we find this situation where he has these 12 sons, what are gonna be the 12 tribes of Israel. And he has just focused in on Joseph, his firstborn son with Rachel. And the word just flat out tells us he was his favorite. So in verse four, <laughs> no surprise here, the word also tells us that they hated him. Can you imagine? They hated him. 
Not only did they hate him, they could not bring themselves to speak peaceably to him. Now, it's one thing to have animosity in your heart towards someone, but you're talking about when they would pass in the mornings, there was no good morning. If they were to uh, pass each other in the hallway at home, so to speak, it wasn't excuse me. There was no peaceable conversation between them at all. So, you keep that in mind as we read from Genesis chapter 35, verses 5 through 7. Then Joseph had a dream. <laughs> when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. There we were, binding sheaves of grain in the field. Suddenly, my sheaf stood up and your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. Now, my initial reaction, I don't know about you, but my initial reaction to this is, why in the world would you say this out loud? <laughs> why would you do that? I mean, we already know they never spoke peaceably to him. They hated him, and surely he knew that, right? I mean, he's not a little kid here. He's probably um, coming into his teenage years. He is very well aware of social cues and the way people perceive him and feel about him. Was this really the best way to bridge a gap? I sort of think maybe not. But I think the answer to that question is that when God speaks to us, you can't keep silent. You know, I, th I think that's true even today. But then dreams were, were a primary way that God spoke to people. And dreams should always be backed up with Scripture today. The primary way that God speaks to His people today is through His Word. And the Lord is most glorified when we proclaim those things that He has spoken to us in His Word. When we proclaim those things He's told us, that He wants us to believe in faith about our life, He is most glorified when we testify about those things with our mouth, but we can't see it with our eyes. Claiming those things that are not as if they were before they are, that is what Joseph is doing. But we also have to consider this. Before we just start saying, well, Joseph was obviously so very spiritual, <laughs> that's why he was testifying about this dream, we also have to consider that verse 6 says, listen, which means pay attention. You know, it's human nature to taunt, isn't it? The Bible tells us in Psalm 51, we are all born of a sinful nature. And in Psalm 22, it tells us that foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. So, it may be that he's taunting his brothers a little bit here, right? We know he's a tattletale, so what would keep him from, from maybe rubbing that in just a little bit? I don't know. Perhaps Joseph's change that we see later on in Genesis actually comes as a result of time that he spends quite literally in a pit. I don't know about you, but the times that I have spent in a proverbial pit have certainly changed me. So either way, what's important is that Joseph is testifying about his dream. He's trying to share it with them, and his brothers react exactly the way you think they would. Look at Genesis 37 verse 8. It says, are you really going to reign over us? His brothers asked him, are you really going to rule us? So they hated him even more because of his dream and what he had said. So they are at this point totally indignant. They absolutely cannot believe that this little brat is coming to them and talking about how they are one day going to worship or bow down or what is the point, Joseph? Why are you talking about this? Well, you know, I think there are some really important things to remember when we start to share the truth, which is God's Word, with people. We need to remember Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. 
Jesus is talking to his disciples and he says, look, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as serpents and as gentle as doves. So God knows that that when we go out to proclaim his word, we are going out into a world that is full of animosity toward him. That's what sin does. And he is saying, I'm sending you out with my word, but I need you to be wise, gentle, but wise. Timing, attitude, and tone are huge in delivering God's word. I mean, huge. And Joseph is lacking just a little bit in those areas. And lastly, this is just a reminder to parent well, you know. No favoritism. There is just no place for favoritism among God's people. And we've talked about that already in our lessons. Teach humility. Teach our children to to love others as we love ourselves. And if we can go, that love is what makes the ground ready for people to receive God's word. And if we can teach that and that lesson sinks in, then people are going to be way more receptive to what God is saying through us. So because of who he was, Joseph that is, and how he had been raised as the favorite, they didn't take his dream seriously. So God gave him another dream. Let's look at Genesis chapter 37, verse, verses 9 through 11. It says, Then he had another dream and told it to his brothers. Look, he said, I had another dream. And this time the sun, moon, and 11 stars were bowing down to me. He told his father and brothers, but his father rebuked him. What kind of dream is this that you've had? He said, are your mother and brothers and I going to bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. So God is very clearly saying that Joseph is going to rule over his family. And this seems completely ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, these are... These are shepherds. They're not royalty. It makes absolutely no sense. And this second dream contained important additions. Mom and dad. Now, Rachel was dead, so we know that he's not talking about Rachel. Chances are very good that scripture is actually pointing to either Bilhah, which was um, Rachel's maidservant that had been given to Jacob, or possibly to Leah, Jacob's first wife. So, this encompasses the entire family. There is no one left out of this second dream. So Jacob's response, again, he just perceives this as being completely absurd. You know, it's one thing for you to talk about your brothers bowing down to you, but when you bring your mom and I in, that's a different story. So the Hebrew word jealous that is used there um, in that scripture, it isn't just a superficial emotion. Um, we use that word a lot, don't we, in our culture. Um, <laughs> we, I, I know there are times that my, um, I'll, I'll be sitting with my five-year-old and he, the dog will come up and try to get into um, my lap with the five-year-old and the five-year-old will say, he is so jelly. And it's just, it is so funny because he's saying that the dog is jealous of him. We throw that word around a lot. In the Hebrew, though, it was not a word to be tossed around. Jealous actually um, represented a, a hostile and disruptive passion. It meant something when you were jealous. It's why it was so impactful when God says he is jealous for us. So a, a disruptive passion. And y'all, these brothers are certainly about to disrupt things. So... His father kept the matter in mind. Jacob was no stranger to God speaking through dreams, right? We know that God met with Jacob through a dream. Um, Jacob's ladder, he saw the angels going up and down to and from heaven. And he also 
realized at that point in his life that God could do anything he wanted to do, even if it seemed impossible. You remember at that time, it was revealed to Jacob that he would actually be brought back to that place where he was seeing that dream and he would worship there. Now, in that moment, Jacob was on the run for his life. It was inconceivable that he would come back and worship God there, but he did. And so Jacob is keeping this matter in mind because those thoughts are, are very clearly just playing over in his mind. He knows that God can do what seems impossible. Now, have you ever heard the expression, you are who you hang out with? Well, Jacob's brothers are always hanging out with each other. So you can imagine that as they start to talk about Joseph, Joseph's brothers rather, are always with each other. You can imagine as they start to talk about Joseph, how it just builds, emotion builds on top of emotion. I don't know how it is in your family, but when my family gets together, if one of us has a problem and we start talking about it, all of a sudden somebody else will chime in and say, you know, that really doesn't sound right. And before you know it, we can have a room full of people that are angry about one person's problem. That is the situation here. These brothers get together and it just builds emotion on top of emotion. And what starts out as sarcasm quickly turns sadistic. So let's look at um, Genesis chapter 37. Before we do, let me give you a little background. Joseph has gone to look for his brothers. So Shechem was 50 miles north of their home. And if you remember, Shechem was in our lesson last week. We learned that the people of Shechem had a holy terror that fell on them, which was why they did not go after Jacob and his sons. So he goes to Shechem. Obviously, that holy terror is still in place and still protecting Jacob and his sons. He goes to Shechem and they're not there. Somebody in Shechem tells them, well, they went to Dothan, which is 15 miles beyond Shechem. So that's where they are. That's where we pick up in Genesis chapter 37, verses 19 and 20. It says, they said to one another, here comes that dreamer. Come on, let's kill him and throw him into one of the pits. We can say that a vicious animal ate him. Then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. Well, that escalated quickly, didn't it? So, I don't believe that individually these brothers would have come up with this plan. Say for instance, if Dan was just standing out in the middle of this field and he saw Joseph running toward him, looking for him, I don't think that he individually would have said, you know what, I think today's the day I'm gonna kill my brother and throw him in a pit. I don't think so. But because they were all together, because they had been literally just stewing over these dreams and the audacity that this little brother had, when they see him, it ignites sin in their life. It ignites them to, to start contriving this plan that is absolutely terrible. Conspiracy is born. So I think a really important question for us to ask ourselves is, who are we surrounding ourselves with? Who do we hang out with? Are the people that are um, around us the most, are they positive? Are they uplifting? Do they encourage us? Do they speak life over us? Or do they drag you down <laughs> mentally and emotionally just continually stirring up the things about your life that you like least. And let me just say here, we hear that term speak life a lot. <laughs> Speaking life over someone does not mean that you say what they want to hear. That is not speaking life. And now it may be what they want to hear in some cases, but that's not the definition of speaking life over somebody. It means that you speak the truth, which is God's opinion on a matter. That is the truth based on God's word. It is his opinion on a matter. And you do it in love. When God's truth is released with love, that is life. That is speaking life over somebody. And anything else can quickly become toxic. So, the brothers have a plan 
to kill Joseph. Let's look at verses 21 and 22. When Reuben heard this, he tried to save him from them. He said, let's not take his life. Reuben also said to them, don't shed blood. Throw him into this pit in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Intending to rescue him from their hands and return him to his father. So finally, someone is willing to speak against this evil plan. And we're not exactly sure why. The Bible doesn't tell us why Reuben, the firstborn son, is the one that is stepping up and saying, let's don't take it this far. Maybe he hated violence. He does say that he, he doesn't want to shed blood, but he's also saying, let's throw him in a pit, which means he's going to starve to death. So that's not exactly the most pleasant way to go. So I'm not sure if that's it. Maybe he uh, wants to reconcile with his father. Reuben, we learn in Genesis chapter 35, verse 22, had actually slept with Jacob's concubine, Bilhah. And I'm quite sure that caused some problems. So maybe he saw this as an opportunity to, to reconcile with Jacob. Whatever the reason, the firstborn, Reuben, planned to save Joseph. So the plan begins. Let's look at verse 23 and 24. When Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped off his robe, the robe of many colors that he had on. Then they took him and threw him into the pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. So they stripped him of his robe. Now, First of all, can we just talk about this robe for a second? This was like the thorn in their side. Like this was the robe that Jacob had given to Joseph. It was a coat of many colors, you might say. It was so super special. And it was also what marked him. It was like the thing that got on their nerves the most, apparently. Now, when they, it says that he, they were stripped him of his robe, we would like to think that that just meant they gently removed his coat, and then threw him in the pit. Actually, the Hebrew verb stripped generally, now not always, but generally means to violently strip naked. So, if Jacob is clothed at all, he is in a mess, y'all, a mess. And we've talked about how Jacob could have parented differently, and maybe that might help the situation. We've talked about how Joseph could use a little bit of a different approach <laughs> um, in his timing and attitude and tone. And it's, it's at these parts in the lesson that I just wish that you were right here in this room with me. <laughs> and I could say, you know, who do you most relate to in this story? Do you most relate to Jacob? Do you most relate to, to Joseph? And what about the brothers? They needed to focus less on Joseph and more on what God was doing. Can you relate to that? I mean, is there somebody right now that they are, they are on your last nerve? Like, they are just on your nerves. And everything they do gets on your nerves. Everything they say gets on your nerves. And I think that what we can see right here in this lesson is that if those brothers' attention had been on God more and Joseph less, it never would have escalated to this. I mean, at any point, one of these brothers could have, after hearing this dream, could have sought the Lord. They could, they could have said, you know, God, my brother has come to me with this dream, and can you tell me what this means, what this means for our family? God didn't love Joseph more than he loved these other brothers. They are all part of the 12 tribes of Israel just because Jacob had shown favoritism to Joseph. All of a sudden, it's like the brothers didn't even consider how God felt about them because they knew how their dad felt about them. Don't make that mistake. Don't make that mistake. It's easy to focus on the messenger, Joseph, but that's idolatry. And that's not good. Their obsession with Joseph, albeit negative, had gotten them totally off track. So we have to ask ourselves, 
Is there anybody or anything that I'm focusing too much on? Is there anything that I have set up as an idol that just takes my time and my energy, that takes my focus off of God? When we answer yes, we're not just setting ourselves up for disaster, we're setting those people around us up for disaster too. Let's look at Genesis chapter 37, verse 25. Then they sat down to eat a meal. They looked up and there was a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were carrying aromatic gum, balsam, and resin going down to Egypt. Now, first, <laughs> I think it's important to make sure you know, this is not like a celebration meal. They're not going, whew, I tell you what, that was a hard day's work, guys. Let's sit down and, and have supper. They're not Southern. <laughs> this, this is something that they are doing because they have to think about what is next. They listen to Reuben, right? So now Joseph is alive, which is a problem because if they let him go, well, let's say they leave him in the pit. He's going to die. They can't leave him in the pit. But if they let him go, we already know he's a tattletale. He's just going to run back and tell dad everything that they've done. And then what's going to happen? And he's going to love him even more. And there's going to be even more outcast. So the solution presents itself. So through Dothan was a trade route. And they had obviously discussed killing him again, because if you'll look right here in verse 26 and 27, Judah is going to speak up, okay? He says, Then Judah said to his brothers, What do we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay a hand on him. For he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. So here, Judah, the middle-born child to Leah, the negotiator here, is presenting three flaws in their scheme. First, he says, there's no profit here. <laughs> and truly, this is what's driving him. There's no profit to be had. We don't, we don't make anything. We don't gain anything if we kill him. He's of no use to us. Two, he appeals to um, their sensitive side. He says that Joseph is their brother. And then the third thing is that they're risking God's curse. He refers to covering up his blood, which is a reminder of another place in scripture where we read about one brother killing another brother, which was Cain and Abel. And we know how God felt about that. And very likely so did Judah. At the end of the day, though, it really was greed that was driving him. And at the end of the day, Judah's logic prevailed. They sold Joseph into slavery and at a sale price at that. We learn uh, later on in scripture that the going rate for a slave was 30 shekels. They sold Joseph for 20 shekels. Talk about adding insult to injury. And, you know, maybe you relate to this Joseph. Maybe you're alone. You feel abandoned. You're tattered in every way. Clearly, Joseph's family was not receptive to the plan that God had for him. At least, not yet. So, what lessons can we learn from Joseph? Well, when we look at this and we, we want to see what the application is in our lives, I think there's a few things. First, testifying about what God has said is good. We should do that. We should share with others how God's Word has spoken to us and, and verses and scriptures that we are standing on. But we have to remember that our timing and our tone and most of all, the attitude that we are delivering those, those things with, it is critical. It makes all the difference. We also have to use discernment, right? When we speak, we want to be as wise as serpents, but as gentle as doves. We don't want to hammer down the truth on anybody. We want to think about who we're talking to and where they're coming from, how they've been raised, what their experiences are. We don't want to sugarcoat the truth 
But we do want to consider who we're talking to and how we can be wise and gentle simultaneously. We also have to think about who we associate with and what we're filling our minds with. You know, that's going to have a great impact on our actions. Where do we spend most of our time? Where do we spend the first few minutes of our time? Each day, it is such a temptation to me um, to reach over from my nightstand and grab my phone and just scroll through and see my notifications that I got for that day. Whatever I do first thing in the morning sets the tone for my day. And then I'm more apt to spend more time there. So how do we start our day? Are we starting it in social media? Are we starting it in God's Word? Nobody is perfect at that, but it's something to consider when we're in a situation, when we want to know something, when we have questions about things, big things. Do we go to God's Word or do we go to our cell phone? These are things that we probably do want to consider. And finally, even in a pit, God is sovereign. Isn't that good news? All that God had revealed to Joseph would take place. That and actually a whole lot more. Next week, we're going to talk about temptation. And we're going to see how Joseph honored God through the midst of it. Joseph's story, if it's been a while since you have visited it or if you've never heard it before, I just want to encourage you to read ahead if you want to, but definitely to join us back next week. We're going to really be talking about how we can glorify God even when we're tempted. So would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for the opportunity to study your word. Lord, we don't want to take that for granted. We know that there are places um, all over the world that do not have the luxury, the privilege, Lord, of opening your word and studying it in freedom. And so we just thank you for that privilege. God, I thank you for the Holy Spirit that teaches this lesson. It is not me. I am just a facilitator. But God, I thank you that your Holy Spirit speaks to my heart and to the hearts of those who are listening. And God, we thank you for the lessons that you've taught us today through Jacob and Joseph and his brothers. Lord, let us be wise as serpents and gentle as doves. And God, the fact that we're going out among wolves, don't let that slow us down, Lord. You, every single thing that you have called us to, you have equipped us for. God, let us be bold in sharing our faith and use discernment and wisdom when doing so. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope that you'll join us again next week.